Hey, I'm Sarah Tanner. I'm the college ministry associate here at Northside, and um, part of my role is staffing the NSC building, which is the church's new building next to the Weatherford College campus. It um, One thing that's cool about it is it's got a parking lot in WC that we get to like enter through that to us. So like we're super close to campus. So it's been a real big blessing that we're able to be up there because we get to meet up there every week for our small groups and for our monthly worship service, which is actually tomorrow night. Um, so I'm super pumped about that. Um, and it's just something I like to share with our people in our church and in our ministry. So I have served in the college um, ministry for the last three years as a small group leader and was involved in it for the year before that. A little other backstory on myself is I have a bachelor's in business from Tarleton that I got last December, and I'm currently working towards my master's in theological studies at DBU. I got saved when I was about five or six-ish. I wouldn't, like, I used to go through, like, a thing where I would just be kind of a, unsure of whether or not I was saved then, but at this point in my life, I'm confident that that is when I got saved. But I would say that, like, college was the big changing point in my walk with God. It really was the point in time where I started being challenged and I really learned what it looked like to to walk with God and to ask him what do you want for my life and not just do what I want and ask him to bless that so that was that was kind of a um, big that is the big thing for me that kind of affected why I'm involved in our college ministry still is just because like that was such a like it's been such a transformative period of my life that I want to get to do that with other students and help them do the same so that's just a little bit about me. Uh, I chose this chapter because Acts 10 has always been a favorite of mine. Uh, a few years ago, I actually got a dorky nickname from my friend. He called me Sarah the Tanner, and he decided that because we read this chapter in College Hour that it was going to be Simon the Tanner after that. So that kind of stuck in that. Like That was one of our first times reading it, and that kind of helped me just start paying more attention to this chapter. And then after that, when I had read it a couple of times, I started learning like, this is one of the first big starting points of sharing the gospel with the Gentiles outside, uh, like beside, like that was one of the first things that they got shared with, which eventually led to even us getting to know, like go know Jesus, cause we're Gentiles too. So like, to me, the, like the continual impact of that has made such a big deal that to me, it's like one of my favorite chapters. So what we're going to talk about today is in Acts 10, the part that stuck out to me this time when I read it, because every time it feels like it's something different, is verses 9 through 23. So that's what we're going to talk about today. While y'all are flipping there, I'm going to give y'all a little bit of background on the story. So if you didn't get the chance to read the first eight verses of this chapter, what's happening is a man named Cornelius, he is a Roman centurion and he is in Caesarea. In Caesarea, he is walking with God, following God, being obedient to God, and God gives him a vision saying, send, send someone to go to Joppa and find Simon the Tanner at, find Simon the Tanner's house and find, ask for a man named Peter and bring him to you and he will share with you. So Cornelius sends two of his servants and a Roman soldier, which is, we'll explain why that's all significant later. So he sends all of them to go find Peter, and that's where we're about to pick up in this story. So like I said, Cornelius lives in Caesarea. The When Peter later in this chapter goes to Caesarea, that is part of Samaria, which if you know anything about the Gospels, and you may remember the fact that the Jews and the Samaritans did not jive with each other, like they did not get along. So it was a big deal that like the reason that it's such a big deal is because the Samaritans are the effect of a 750 year prejudice. Like it's existed for the past 750 years from when the Assyrians, they went um, and took over in Israel for a while and sent half of the people into exile somewhere else and kept the others there to keep them separated so that way they couldn't revolt against the Assyrians. So while they're separated, the ones that are off and then the ones that are here, the ones that are here still in Israel, they marry in with pagans from other cultures. And then, so then after all this is done, a few years pass or a while passes, um, the Assyrian exile is over. The other Israelites get to come back. When they come back, they realize that the, Samar the Israelites that have been there um, they view them as unclean because they've married in with other 
cultures. So they become known as unclean, and those are the people that become the Samaritans. So just it's helpful to know in this passage, like, that is why yeah. this is a, a cultural not, like, it doesn't go well with their culture and why there are, like, why don't, they don't like each other. It's also been along for 750 years. So, like, America's less than 750 years old to show, like, how big of a, a mindset this is in the Israelite people. So we're going to, I find it easier that for y'all and for me, that if we break it up into smaller sections, it just makes it easier for us to to see what God showed us. And plus, I don't want to overwhelm with any of the things that I found. So it's easier to break it up into sections and talk about what we found in those sections. So I'm going to start off in verse nine. The next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop at the sixth hour to pray. But he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance and saw the heavens opened and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him a second time, what God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and the thing was taken up at once to heaven. So for me, it was really helpful because I've read this passage several times before, but I've never actually read in relation to this verse what that Levitical law said. So I wanted to go back and see what it actually said. And I know that in y'all's rooted binders, that one of y'all's questions encourages y'all to look at the cross-references um, to help y'all interpret better. So... Um, Some of y'all may have got the chance to, some of y'all may not have, but this is me doing the same concept. I went and found the cross-reference, which was Leviticus 11. So the whole chapter talks about laws of the cleanliness of which animals can be eaten and which ones cannot, like which ones are unclean. So verse 44 of Leviticus 11 says, For I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. So God is calling the Israelite people back then to remember the God who is asking them to do this. He gives them the why. He, um, they're his people and he's calling them to resemble him. This is a response. This whole command is a response to what he has already done for them. It's about being holy and resembling him. It's not about, about the animal. So this, that's what the Levitical law says about that. So that's just kind of helpful for this passage. One thing that stuck out to me was verse 14, where Peter is arguing with God and he says, by no means, Lord. One thing that's interesting is that like when I remembered, like this is the creator of the universe, like he's talking to God, the creator of the universe, and he's arguing with him, which like that makes it feel like he's doubting God's ability to make this thing clean when God has called it clean. Another thing that I thought was interesting is I um, read a commentary related to this one and then looked at it a little further because of that. So a couple different definitions for Lord in this verse is sovereign and the one who has control of the person. So Peter is literally saying in this moment, Lord who is in, like God who is in control of me, I'm not going to obey you. Um, Which is like such a contradictory statement. Like Peter Peter is claiming that God is sovereign over his life, but disobeying him at the same time, which I think we do a lot of the same thing. So that was kind of like a reflective moment for me of like, how does that resemble me also? So that was one thing that I thought was really like kick in the gut in this passage. So um, another thing is that there's a that's helpful to know with this passage is one of the other cross-references is Matthew 15, where Jesus established um, to, to Peter and the other disciples that what a man eats is not what makes him unclean. He says in Matthew 15, 11, it is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a person. So that happens, he explains it. And then Peter asks right after he said that, he said, he's like, Jesus, what does that mean? And then, so Jesus rewords it again in verses 17 through 20 for Peter. Do you not see what, that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? But what comes out of a mouth proceeds from the heart. This defiles a person. 
For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and slander. These are what defile a person, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile anyone. So, like, I'm not saying don't wash your hands. Oh, please wash your hands. But, like, the whole point of this is that what's in, like, what you eat is not what's defiling you. And Jesus explained this to Peter back in Matthew. Um, this is when all of that takes place. And even after Jesus' resurrection and death and resurrection, Peter still doesn't understand this. One thing that I thought, um, it took me a couple times reading it for this part to catch, but in verse 16, it says that this vision happened three times, that which made me think back to when Peter denied Jesus three times. And then Jesus asked him if he loved him three times. Like, if God is mentioning something three times, it's probably catching his attention. So now we're going to read verses 17 through 20. Now, while Peter was inwardly perplexed as to what the vision that he had seen might mean, behold, the men who were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Simon's house, stood at the gate and called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter was pondering the vision, the spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. So one thing that I liked in this is like while Peter is still pondering what, what that vision meant, the men are showing up. So like to me, that's kind of a, sign, like a reminder of like when God is stirring something in my heart or if I've just asked him, to reveal something to me, to be expectant and observant because you don't want to miss out on what he's about to show you. Verse 20, um, I noticed that was one of y'all's, I think that was y'all's passage, y'all's memories verse in y'all's binders this week. And it was really one that like probably stuck out to most to me the most in the whole section that we focus on today. Um, and one thing I found, like one thing that I found with for myself, if I want like a better, fuller understanding of it, or if I don't understand something, it helps to read it in a couple different versions. So I have it in the CSB and the ESV that I'm going to read to you real quick. So the CSB is, get up, go downstairs and go with them with no doubts at all because I have sent them. And the ESV is, rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation for I have sent them. So like, I liked the two different versions there, but I also like... I still got kind of stuck on the word hesitation because mine has a footnote at the bottom of my Bible that says um, to accompany them, making no distinction. So another little trick that if you want to kind of understand the specific word a little bit more, instead of just immediately Googling what that word is, I like to see how it looks in a couple different ways. So I'll go to this app or website called the Blue Letter Bible that I can go click on that specific verse and then pick on pick that specific word so I can see um, what what the different definitions in the Bible of that word are because some words don't translate directly into words one word so that makes it more helpful and then you can also see it in the context of other verses so I find that super helpful so the word for hesitation in this passage is diacrino um, that word also stands for discrimination, judgment, and doubt. So God is telling Peter to go to, to go with these men without any of that discrimination, hesitation, doubt, because he knows Peter's immediate heart response is probably to jump to all of those things. Because like I said before, it's two Gentiles and a Roman soldier. So he's not going to want to talk to them. And on top of that, the Roman soldier, the Romans were the ones in ruling over the area at that time. So he doesn't like them. So there's literally three separate people he does not want to be going with. So God is already telling him, like, regardless of that, be obedient to me. Both of the examples that this passage gives, the metaphor of the food and, and like, killing the animals to eat, and the example with the Gentiles, call Peter to put God over his preferences. I liked that there was a couple different action words used in throughout the passage, verses 13 and 20. Um, verse 13 says, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And verse 20 says, rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation. So in both of those, God is telling Peter to rise. God required action from Peter, which led me to just thinking about it for myself. What has God called me to do? And what action is he calling me to? 
when I ask God what he is calling me to, it opens me up to hear whether or not he is calling me to something different from my preferences. Next, we're going to finish off with verses 21 through 23. And Peter went down to them, to the men and said, I am the one you are looking for. What is the reason for your coming? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man who is well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send to you for to send for you to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. So he invited them in to be his guest. The next day he rose and went away with them, and some of the brothers from Joppa accompanied him. So I think the biggest thing that stuck out to me from verse 20 and with these is God just told Peter, go with them without hesitation. So Peter didn't know who was going to be down there or what they were going to ask of him, but he knew God had commanded them to. Um, so God is asking him to be obedient regardless of those circumstances. And it's cool because at the end of the chapter, we can read in verses 44 through 30 through 45, we get to see the result of Peter's obedience. Verse 44 and 45 says, While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. So the Gentiles getting saved is a cool example of what happened when Peter was obedient, regardless of his preferences and the circumstances. Right now, I want y'all to think about what is something that God is calling you to choose him over. One thing that I had to learn last year about choosing God over is um, one preference that I have is my desire to move elsewhere. All the college girls um, have totally heard me say this like 12 billion times. But um, so I, I love my hometown. Don't get me wrong. Like I've loved growing up here. It's been a great place. However, I have always wanted to get to go somewhere else. One thing that... Um, after I was in my last semester of college, I had just got back from a super awesome mission trip, and I was just determined that, like, as soon as I graduated, I was going to go off on mission somewhere. And I was telling everybody about it, getting all excited, like, looking at applications for different, like, ministries that, like, are mission-sending organizations. So, but then, about, like, part of the way through all this process... One of my friends and I were having a conversation and she asked me, she's like, have you asked God what he wants for you yet? And my sad and honest answer was, no, I haven't prayed about this yet. So I, after that moment, I started praying about it and very quickly realized it was a no, which now on the, like on the, like the end of that, having got to see that no, and being obedient with that, I can see that like there's so much that I would have missed out on here if I'd not been obedient in what God had said, because there's so much that I got to gain from my time here. But it's still one that I have to work on and continually give him, give to him and ask him what he wants me to do, because it's very easy at the end of any time period season, like to jump to, oh, missions is next. Like it's super easy for me. So that's one I have to like continually work on. So my challenge for y'all, oh, um, while y'all are thinking about y'alls, a couple other examples that kind of help um, you think about what yours could be is other preferences are my type of worship, politics, where my kids go to school, where I live, my life's ambition. All those are different ones that it's helpful to, those are like, those are just some common ones that a lot of people experience. Yours could be something totally different or it could just be one of those and either Either's real. So my challenge for y'all today is to write this down. How is God calling you to choose him over your preferences? And then I want you to think about, you can also write these down. What does it look like to choose him over your preferences? What changes when you put him first? So um, it's okay if it's something you don't have an answer for at this exact moment, but it would be a good thing to ask him what he's calling you to choose him over. So that's my challenge for y'all today. Thanks for letting me have the opportunity to get to talk with all y'all. I'm gonna pray us out so then y'all can break up into your small groups. God, I thank you for this great day and for this opportunity to spend this time with all these ladies digging into your word together. And I pray that 
um, something stuck out to them, whether it was through what I said or what they got to learn in their personal time. I just pray that you would have fruitful discussion for them in their small groups and that it would be honoring to you and just beneficial for their walks with you. I pray that we will each choose you over our preferences and that we'll desire to, that we will want you more than each of those things. I pray just that you would guide us through the rest of our week and as we continue on. In your precious and holy name, amen.